59 and counting up. Um, welcoming Jocelyn Hawthorne from Sydney, uh, where he is the ARC uh, Laureate Fellow Professor of Physics and also the Director of the Sydney Institute for Astronomy. Uh, he's originally from the UK, where he got his bachelor's degree in Birmingham in math, physics, and also computer science before then moving on to Royal uh, Observatory in Greenwich and the University of Sussex, where he got his PhD from. Um, and then within a decade, he moved to Australia to uh, uh, Australian Astronomical Observatory in Sydney, where he really left a <clears throat> lasting mark uh, building many of the instruments uh, a lot of us have heard of and maybe even used, including uh, Tudiev um, and Sammy and Hermes. And he's been um, a head of instrument science at um, AO uh, from 2000 until he moved to the university in 2006 or seven. Um, and for his work, he has been uh, awarded so many prizes, including those from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, uh, Australian Optical Society, Royal Astronomical Society. Um, and I will not really go into detail on the, all of the, what all of the science <laughs> <laughs> has enabled and really uh, spurned so much discovery. But I will sort of lead into this transition uh, to talk by saying how, how just has always been kind of forward thinking of what you can do with this um, exquisite instrumentation. Uh, and so it's not just like building this cutting edge uh, instruments, but also thinking what is possible. And in that context, it's really uh, important that he wrote the science case for the Gaia mission or helped write science case for, for the Gaia mission. And in doing so, he was um, together with Ken Freeman in a very well cited review from uh, 2002 and, um, on what our Milky Way galaxy will look like in this in this new age when all of this new data becomes available. He kind of thought through what this um, uh, new advances uh, uh, on the data side will enable us to learn about the physics of galaxy formation. And this is like a really uh, seminal piece of work that basically define how we talk about the Milky Way these days. They, there's a number of uh, nomenclature uh, uh, terms that we still use today, like uh, chemical tagging and galactic archaeology that were first uh, uh, brought to light uh, by Joss and Ken. And um, I guess today we, we are meeting uh, sort of in the post Gaia launch uh, era where uh, many of these ideas have come to fruition. Um, but what's most exciting and what I guess usually happens when you sort of break new grounds in terms of uh, instrument precision is that there are also uh, a few surprises. And uh, the topic of Joss's talk today is galactic se uh, seismology, something we really didn't expect uh, to find in the, uh, in the data, but there it was fairly prominent and uh, we're like very grateful to have Joss tell us more about it. Um, galactic seismology, um, in my latest paper 2020 with Torsten Tepe Garcia, um, I'm about to upload the final accepted copy. We're waiting any day now for acceptance from MN. Um, I've included a, a history in the appendix uh, on, on this. this. This subject really started uh, in the 80s. Uh, it can be traced back um, much further in, into the past, the tomb rays of this world, Mestales and so on. Um, but in fact, the language of galactic seismology was laid down by a Japanese dynamics group and later on by Larry Widrow. Um, but anyway, give a nice history. I hope you'll find that a very readable history about the use of modal analysis in galaxies. Uh, and I think this subject has really come to the fore uh, with the radio velocity survey in Gaia. We've had 7 million stars with exquisite 60 phase space information. Uh, we'll have 35 million stars with uh, Gaia DR3 in the middle of 2022. So one can only imagine what that will reveal. Um, so galactic seismology, I think of this as a subset of galactic archaeology, quite a small subset as it turns out, um, uh, but it, uh, the language is laid down by dynamicists over some number of years. So what I want to show you is uh, our insight or our understanding of what causes this bizarre phase space signature. Um, it's sometimes called a phase space spiral. We call it a phase spiral because like phase mixing, you don't say phase space mixing. 
So we just use that compact language because we talk about phase spiral evolution, phase spiral dynamics and so on. Um, this is triggered by some bizarre phenomenon in the galaxy and the, even though there were hints going back many years, Issa Gaia has completely and utterly revolutionized our understanding of waves in the galactic disk as I'll, as I'll get to. I do want to acknowledge uh, ongoing uh, uh, su sort of support and discussions with the Kovar team, Ken Freeman in particular, Sanjeev Sharma, Sarah Martel, Dan Zucker, and a host of others. Um, and my mind's gone now, but there are 30 or 40 people. Uh, but Torsten Tapa Garcia has been very prominent in the analysis. He's really quite a, a marvelous uh, model of galaxies and has absorbed new codes like uh, the Agama code that came out of Cambridge by Evgeny Vasiliev. Uh, which was crucial to uh, forming dynamical models of the galaxy with equilibrium even before you start to model the uh, effective impacts. Okay, so um, anyway, that's my introduction. I have all these various hats, uh, but I suppose I think we'll all agree now that there's been a revolution. Uh, ESA Gaia, NASA Kepler, NASA TESS, um, and they're all in their own way providing important information, fundamental information, but I think ESA Gaia will have the, la the longest lasting impact um, and that will carry on until 2024 at least, I think. Um, and we're going to have a lot of new rich data and consequences of these data, which we can only, we can barely foresee actually. Every time things are delivered by Gaia, new things happen. Uh, I don't think anyone really foresaw very clearly. So this is a picture put together by, it's a pointless map. These are the individual measurements from Gaia that's been reconstructed into a, a North Sky image, which of course you recognize. So astronomers map the sky um, in different bands. The best band is the mid-infrared if you want to reconstruct what the galaxy looks like thermographically from the outside. The sun's position is shown here. The bar is at some angle to us by like 20 degrees or so. And you can go off in different directions. Um, look at the sky, look at the star counts. Uh, and if you have some measure on distance using color, there's no particular problem with dust, although there's problems with pH emission. You can turn this around as a photometric distance and form a map. And this has been done by different people. This is a particular paper by Ness and Lang, 2016, using the WISE data. And what this shows, I think rather spectacularly, is that the galactic, inner galactic disk is very flat and very thin. Uh, and the, for example, the bar is very aligned uh, with that inner disk. As the, my annual reviews with Gerhardt 2016 shows that there's an incredible alignment with the, and there's also this rather extended long bar that's been found by a number of people. That gives us a very beautiful picture of what the galaxy looks like if we were able to view it from, from the outside. So galactic archaeology, one of the problems of galactic archaeology is that you're wanting to use ages and abundances and dynamics of galaxy stars to unravel past events, and that's been done rather successfully. Anna, of course, has made her own contributions. Lena Dongia online, I noticed she's also made very beautiful contributions to this field, and I'm sure many others of you have too. Um, the trouble, of course, is that you have you, what you, our, our framework is often a dynamical equilibrium situation. And the question is, can we think of the galaxy as having dynamical equilibrium? And I think the answer is no. The more we know about the Milky Way, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of substructure and lots of deviations from equilibrium. So we have a real job on our hands. How do we form a potential density pairing for something which has all these extra modes? But those modes, I don't think of it as weather. I gave a talk at the Cavalier a few years ago, the Blackboard Lunch, which is online, you can see this, where I was asked the question by David Gross, you know, is it all just weather? Do we really care? And my, my comment in that Blackboard discussion was we do care. We're looking at resonances. We're looking at standing waves, moving waves. We're looking at all sorts of uh, uh, essentially modal properties of a complex dynamical system. And it's not weather at the moment because we, we can use this information to interpret what it is we see and, and learn something about the evolution of our galaxy. So this potential density pairing is a real problem. Um, and I think there has been some very important steps forward here. Binney, of course, has his rather nice methods to do with potential density reconstruction of disks. Um, but, what the, but what I was particularly impressed by was the Evgeny Vasiliev's work. He produces what's called the A gamma code, where he gives you dynamical equilibrium solutions uh, based on distribution functions. He works act, as well with actions. Uh, and we've used that again. It's a rather steep learning curve to use it properly, but we've used that as our input to, um, to the embody simulations. There's a problem that has affected this field for a long, long time, is you start with, you know, you, let's say you went to my annual reviews with Orphan Gerhardt, and you look at our properties for the bulge, the bar, the disk, the thick disk, and the halo, and you say, right, let's put all those properties in. You do that, and the thing falls apart. 
those parameterized properties don't tell you how to start a galaxy which stays the way that you specify it for all time, then you hit it with something. So this is a real problem, I think, with all previous work that you end up, you, you specify the Milky Way and it evolves and settles and redistributes before you actually hit it with something. So the A-gamma code has allowed us to really specify rather precisely what we want the bulge and the disk, disks and the halo to be. The, the gas phase is, uh, is something that Torsten is working on now with Evgeny, putting the gas phases into the A-gamma as well. But that's really been a real um, rod center for us because we're able to set up models that don't evolve uh, until we want them to evolve. So then we can learn about equilibrium, we can learn about long-term stability, these are very different things. And we can learn about what are the true excitations of the system induced by an external or an internal perturber. So um, in terms of observations, I should give credit to a lot of work in the past that suggested that there are things going on that we don't understand. Um, there are, um, for example, things that are seen in star counts, um, non-equilibrium structures, this is from the Sloan survey, it's a thermographic slide through the disk. Um, and you can see that you don't just get this exponential, this is a radius uh, zero to 16 kiloparsecs, zero to 10 kiloparsecs vertically, it's a thermographic slice. And you might think you just see a perfect exponential disk, but you do not, you see a disk, it, does, it does certainly declines, it's sort of like an, a hydrostatic atmosphere, uh, but you see all sorts of deviations from a rather clean exponential profile. And the same of course is true in the Halo, as Anna probably has been telling you all about with stream work from streams. So there's a lot of work in the past has been going on showing that there are all sorts of deviations. There's also non-equilibrium kinematics. Um, I was part of this work with uh, Mary Williams in the RAVE survey, Woodrow, Carl and others using other surveys. If you subtract a simple kinematic model, like a, a hydrostatic equilibrium disk from the velocity fields, you find that there are deviations above and below the plane. Uh, in this case, um, orange means minus 15, this is vertical motion in VZ, and uh, purple is plus 15 kilometers per second in VZ. And you find these bizarre wave-like patterns through the galaxy. This has been known about uh, for a few years now. It's also true of star counts. Take the Sloan counts, um, remove the inner part because of confusion, and subtract the northern star counts from the southern star counts. You do not end up with nothing. You end up with this rather bizarre uh, plus minus ripple going off the plane. So the north disk and the south disk, even in the low order mode of star counts, don't subtract cleanly. So the idea that there are things going on which look like these bizarre perturbations, um, and this is, in, this is completely separate from streams and the halo, this is just disk properties, uh, has been known about for a while. I think Heidi Newberg, uh, Elena Dongi and others have been uh, um, have made important contributions to this kind of thinking. So, so people have, uh, have done rather obvious things, like they take these disks. I would not say these are ideal simulations because they take disks that may or may not evolve before they hit them, but let's just go with what has been published. And um, you hit these things with perturbers like uh, sort of transiting dwarfs, and you can easily generate uh, inner bars. You can suppress inner bars if you want to with a suitable choice of disk halo mass fraction and the choice of Q, uh, but you generate the spiral arms in gas or in um, stars, and you can generate outer rings. And uh, others have gone on to show, Elena in particular, uh, rather beautifully, have shown that you get these corrugations and density waves. But it was never made clear by any of these uh, uh, previous authors what the relationship was between these density waves and these corrugations. And this is the work that's been done this year uh, with Torsten Tepe Garcia. Here are cuts in over density. You see, you see what happens in density going up and down. And there's something like an anti correlation with the VZ motion sort of like a sine wave going up and down, density and motion doesn't have to correlate. It can, it, it can be out of phase by pi by two, but it turns out to be a bit more complicated than that. And there's loads of papers you can dig out which talk about uh, um, these excitations induced by passing transiting satellites, and also by bucking bar, bars being pushed around, producing these sorts of waves. So this is the, the question I want to raise. How does the Milky Way ring? And I suppose to go on with this, what can we learn from these, from these ringing effects? So the language of galactic seismology, EA and a number of Japanese colleagues back in the 80s. Uh, and amazingly, this is the same year that astro seismology was declared as a field. Honey Ert has a beautiful review of modern physics which came out last week. And her opening paragraph says that Dougie Goff declared this as an actual field in 1985. <laughs> Although I think it was going on for at least a decade beforehand. Um, but that was the same year that uh, EA and his colleagues talked about galactic seismology in the, in the same way in terms of modes in a fluid and so forth. Um, but I suppose some of the machinery was, was made more uh, self-evident by 
Larry Woodrow and colleagues uh, um, in later years. This is from Larry Woodrow's paper, where he looks at the presence of modes, both in terms of velocity and, uh, and spatial displacement, and in terms of density. Um, Salah, Larrakine, and others have done similar work um, on external galaxies, on actual observations for, for a number of years. And in fact, uh, rather nicely in that same paper, Checkers and Woodrow, they go on to show the difference between uh, isolated versus satellite-driven excitations in terms of seismological waves. Uh, you might ask where to get this from. Well, this can be induced by giant molecular clouds. It can be induced by a live dark matter halo with clumps. And they go on to compare the isolated case with the satellite-driven case. And they do that in terms of density and in, in velocity, and in this case, in vertical displacement. So you can see that the language of looking at modes or Fourier modes, Fourier Henkel transforms in cylindrical coordinates uh, has been around for a while. So this all leads me to what it is that Gaia has actually seen. Um, if you go to Gaia and take the radio velocity survey of 7 million stars, uh, you're now in a position, because of the exquisite distances from proper motions, you're able to um, determine the tangential velocity at a large number of, uh, for a large number of stars with radius. Now, zero, by the way, notice is over here somewhere, four, five, six. So you would know that if it was gas or very young stars uh, confined to circular rotation, you'd get something which is rising sharply in the inner regions and then goes flat. So that's true of gas and maybe very young stars, but it's not true of stars themselves. Essentially, every star is possessing very, very few stars are on circular orbits. And that's because of the con consequence of stars trying to obey a point mass potential at the center and extended mass lock potential. So you've got sort of uh, this two different families of perigee, apogee, relationships and they're basically all processing around the galactic center. So what happens now is you've got stars, if you went to any one of these, in fact there's far fewer than seven million dots here, but if you went to any one of these dots, these stars are performing complex processing orbits uh, around the galactic center. So you do see something of uh, flat rotation in here, but of course most stars are not doing that, they're doing something else. So what was surprising and was not seen, of a course, retroactively, people want to claim it. What was not seen anywhere near as clearly as you see with Gaia are these ridge lines. So these, you see these rather beautiful ridge lines uh, going through the data, and they may have constant, they may define constant energy configurations, they might define constant angular momentum, um, uh, and they've been interpreted in different ways as, as induced by, say, the central bar or by modes due to the mergers or whatever. So there's a whole literature now uh, emerging as to what causes these ridge lines. Now you can plot them different. This is tangential motion versus radial motion, but you could go to a different coordinate frame, tangential versus radial motion. And now these structures begin to emerge as clumps. You would otherwise expect that there was no substructure or a Gaussian cloud. And the Gaussian cloud would be a bit skewed because of stars off the plane um, having this vertical oscillation. So they start to drag asymmetric drift. So this would be a skewed Gaussian cloud. That's not what you see. What you see are arcuate features and clumps. Some of these blobs are open clusters uh, or in association systems, but others are some kind of resonance knocking. And you even see gaps. Gaps are also important in this reference frame. Now, this was first seen with Papakos, uh, with far less acuity and definition by Walter Damon, um, but was seen vastly more uh, clearly uh, in terms of contrast by the uh, ESA Gaia satellite. And this, again, has also created a rather interesting literature in the last couple of years. But what I want to talk about is this. This is the um, uh, plotting Z motions versus vertical motions uh, for um, the 7 million stars. And what you see there, so um, let's, let's think of it for the moment uh, as a, a harmonic oscillator. Imagine you just have a star which has a, a constant amplitude going up and down. Um, and that would be, in this, in this plane, this would be a circle, a perfect circle. If that star was to lose energy uh, in time, that would become a spiral. That would spiral uh, into the center if you were able to track a star. Now, what you've got here is millions of stars. It's, you're not tracking the motion of any one star. You're tracking or the sort of the evolution of any one star. You're tracking, the evil, you're tracking a snapshot in time of millions of stars. And what you see here, which was not expected at all, uh, was this rather beautiful uh, spiral-like dependence. And so one way to, to think of that, and it's not at all intuitive, as I'm about to show you, um, what a, one, way, one way to think of that is you've got uh, sand grains bouncing on a drum skin, and they're all, and it's beautifully elastic drum skin, and they're all achieving their own amplitudes. 
uh, and motions, uh, and then you enforce uh, by bashing the drum skin some sort of impulse, then some of these uh, stars will be on turnaround orbits, which become uh, locked. Uh, and then when you let the thing settle, you've got this essentially this phase based distribution, which has been confined by the impulse. So that's one way to look at this. But what is not at all clear is why this should be encoded in this way. In density, if you look at the density of stars, the spiral, as you'll see in a moment, is very poorly defined. But it's seen clearly in tangential motion. If you encode this as the average tangential motion over thousands of stars per pixel, then you see it. Um, you also see it um, in radial velocity, which is interesting. So the tangential and radial velocity both give you the same kind of signature. Each pixel averaged over radial velocity, you also see a, a radial action. There's another way of seeing, which is even more clear than all of both of those, which I'm, I'm going to get to. So here are the papers. Anne Tocher's paper was a discovery paper, beautiful paper uh, in terms of the beautiful results. Uh, Binney and Schoenrich uh, uh, sort of uh, dashed off a very quick paper, which had a very key insight as to where this encoding comes from, which I thought was very useful, using an impulse. And then there's my papers, uh, Dr. Papaskov, uh, uh, Laporte has some nice papers, and various papers from the, uh, the uh, Lamos team. So there's been a lot of work, and there's been more papers, uh, I think, since. So this is the original paper. This is what it looks like in, um, in density. If you project the, uh, this effect for, for the it's a local volume of essentially a few hundred parsec volume uh, up to maybe a kiloparsec around the sun. And what you see here is a very poorly defined uh, spiral in this space. This is the uh, radial velocity motion of the stars. You see a rather vague spiral. Uh, it does get clearer if you analyze these in different ways. Uh, this is the tangential motion which shows the spiral uh, most clearly. And the encoding, why these are clearer than that, uh, the first insight to this was the Binney and Schoenrich paper, which people have found quite difficult to understand. But I took a while to think about it, had some good chats to James Binney and Ralph. And I think I would say that our paper takes small time over explaining and, and demonstrating how this encoding works. So here's one way to look at it. So if you went to the ZZ space in the local galaxy, and it was all in perfect equilibrium, it had this rather beautiful Gaussian cloud of, of motions. Stars are going round like this because they're oscillating up and down. And then if you were to perturb that, um, there's, there's a, there's a, a, there's a, the angle of velocity is what determines the speed around this, this, uh, these ellipses. If you were to perturb that um, and basically offset those stars te uh, temporally, um, then they want to, they basically now, are you enforcing them into different parts of this phase space and the stars begin to track around uh, at, at different angular velocities than they had before. Now, sorry, this is, when I say angular velocity, I mean the angular z motion, the angular velocity, the angular frequency in, in the z direction. But this still doesn't really tell you why you have the encoding. Now, the encoding comes from the following diagram. The angular frequency, the speed with which you move in this phase space is, is very much defined, predetermined by where you're from in the disk. If you're from the inner disk towards the galactic center, you have a much higher surface density and the angular frequency is much, much faster. If you're from the outer disk, uh, then your, uh, the surface density is much lower and the angular frequency uh, is also much lower. So the question is, what do we see in our neighborhood? Well, it depends if the star is coming in from the outer disk or the inner disk. So, so, and then that couples to V5, because the stars that reach us from the outer disk they're going, their, their, their peri-astron is in our volume. If the stars are from the inner disk, it's the, it's the apo-astron, uh, which determines whether they enter into our volume. So therefore, V phi, because it's a flat rotation curve, so V phi is the same everywhere, but for the effect of the, of the star's orbit. So V phi is encoding something about the, where the star has come from in terms of its uh, angular frequency. Because remember that original diagram of V phi versus R, stars have all, a huge range in, V5 and VR at every position in the galaxy. The gas, of course, doesn't, but the stars do. So basically, this the encoding that you get from this, the, the V5 is coupled to omega Z, and that determines how far stars move around this phase space. So what you end up with is a separation in these ellipses uh, in V5 due to its link to the link to the omega Z because of where the stars come from in the back, where in terms of the volume, our local volume, where the stars actually come from. 
So and this is the point that Vinnie and Chen which make in their, in their paper. So just mention a few more things about the richness of this, of this field. The glass survey, uh, like the Apogee survey, has brought in a lot of richness in terms of uh, elemental abundances. The glass survey has a million stars uh, and uh, over 30 elements, uh, which is uh, sort of like the biggest survey of its kind in terms of number of elements. So this is a beautiful project over the last five years. We probably have another three or four years to go, we hope, uh, on the AAT. We have survived things like bushfires, and it's this 2DF instrument with uh, robotic positioning. Uh, and it's very much uh, successful because of the other surveys. We live in this environment of Tumas, Sloan, uh, APAS, Planstars, and so on. In terms of radio velocities, you've got these surveys, Rave, Apogee, Lamost, and Bundesis as well. Um, and astro seismology has been important, seismic estimates of uh, temperature and log G, uh, and of course, proper motions and parallaxes from Hipparchus and Gaia. So the, 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 all these surveys feed off each other, which is, uh, but what's very nice about the chemistry, here are some of the uh, key players, important people who have made major contributions to the survey to date. Um, I won't have time to, to go through the other contributions, but they've all been uh, quite, quite wonderful. You'll recognize some of the Americans, I'm sure, Sarah and Michael, Michael Hayden, who worked with the Apogee survey, Sarah Martel and Dan Zucker, um, and there are people from all over the world. Some of us look like with the, uh, from America's most wanted, uh, but I assure you that we're all working scientists. Um, okay, so, um, all right. Uh, the radio velocity is something else we provide, which is very crucial to what I'm about to show you. Uh, Gaia radio velocities right now aren't particularly good. It's the phase space information, the other, the other dimensions which are important, lateral transverse motions. Um, Gala uh, is better than Gaia over the magnitude range from sort of ninth up to 14th magnitude. You can see that we're getting below half a kilometer per second. I think Apogee does something rather comparable. And a real revelation there has been to remove uh, absorption line transitions, which you associate with wind properties of stars. You, you can't just use every absorption line and get, a, and get a good template and go and say, there's my, the stars, lots of stars have very weak signatures due to um, stellar or chromospheric activity. So a very careful work, work was done by Thomas Zwitter and the, Gaia, and the Gaia team. He's part of the Gaia team. He's also part of Kalar to get this sort of performance. And it really did improve this by 30, 50% or something. So uh, you have to be very judicial. Uh, you have to be very sort of careful about how you choose your templates when you do your radio velocity work. And I think the latest release is even better. But I think Apogee has done something rather similar. So the radio velocity information you get from these million stars is significantly better. And we combine that for the million stars uh, with, the, with the before Gaia astrometric work. So um, one of the things, I won't have time to go into this in too, too much detail, but what the Galar survey has been giving us is um, essentially chemical tags. This is the point that in, in the annual reviews that Ken and I were making back in 2002, is that there are no real invariants for stars. Action angles, actions aren't real invariants at all. There might be good invariants for a few orbits, but not more than a few orbits because of things like migration uh, in, within the disk. So stars really don't keep their, they're not adiabatic invariants, to be honest. To be truthful about it. And you don't see that either in simulations. You see things begin to move around in modern simulations. So age, uh, of course, is not an invariant, nor is location and motion. So the only chance you've really got is the, is the high dimensional chemistry, which is why chemical tagging is potentially so powerful. Um, something else to be aware of is that uh, if you're not aware of this, this is what the Apogee survey discovered and was confirmed by the Galar survey, is that the, the galaxy is very interesting in terms of its chemical distribution. The alpha rich disk has been known about for a very long time, but uh, the alpha rich disk truncates uh, local to us. And then, but, and the alpha poor disk, this is the mass carrying disk, that's thin locally, but it's actually thick further out. So it's no point calling alpha rich the thick disk and the alpha poor the thin disk, because in fact, as you get beyond the southern neighborhood, they switch roles in a sense. The alpha rich disk just sort of disappears. So in terms of chemistry and in terms of action spaces, we are really beginning to get some great insight now into the inner workings of our galaxy. This is from my 2019 paper. We're basically able to look at the actions, the amount of motion in Z, the amount of motion in radius, and the amount of uh, uh, motion in, in Z. This is the angular momentum around the central uh, center. And we're looking at those actions in terms of metallicities and different uh, chemical elements. And we're able to see distributions that are, if you look in detail, are quite different in terms of the mass carrying alpha-poor disk or the alpha-rich disk. 
So this is the challenge now for simulations. If you really want to get into this game of trying to understand the galaxy, it's so irritating when you hear cosmology types with their pathetic little Milky Way analog say that they've, they've solved the disk. They really haven't. They're, in fact, if you look at uh, Yesa van der Sander's SAMI paper, it shows you that none of the simulations get even close to really uh, getting down even fundamental properties of the Milky Way. Certainly not the alpha thick, alpha poor, alpha rich, alpha and alpha, uh, uh, alpha poor components and the properties of those components are way off. I would give, uh, uh, they're doing a very good job in terms of some generic volumetric properties, but not doing a very good job on the details of what we're now learning. So this action angle space, I've looked at a number of simulations that predict this chemistry and they don't get this right at all. There's something mysterious about the, the uh, alpha rich, alpha poor action space. And I've had this discussion with the fire team, for example, Andrew Wetzel and, and others. So you can slice by action. I won't have time to go through this, unfortunately, uh, but you can go through my paper. You can slice by action and ask yourself, how does the phase spiral show up? Do you see it in action? Do you see it in stars which have strong radio motions or, or in circular motions? Um, you can slice it in um, location. You, know, you can move around. You can go in a disk, out of disk. You can go in azimuth one way or the other way. And where in action do you see it? And the phase spiral, the properties of the phase spiral are not constant. They're everywhere on the disk, but the strength of the phase spiral changes depending on where you are in an outer, some kind of wave-like property which has its own amplitude as a function of location. You can slice by chemistry and ask if it's, if it's the alpha poor or the alpha rich component which carries the, the, uh, the signature the strongest. And you can slice by age. Is it the young stars or the old stars? As a sort of a brief summary statement, it's a bit more complex than this, it's the younger stars and the more circularized orbits and stars closer to the plane uh, that show the signature strongest. Um, it's tempting to say, well, is it because of number counts? Is it because if you, do you, if you weight these by, uh, by the number of stars you have on in the plane and off the plane, it still happens to be true that it's the younger populations. I don't mean very young, I mean, you know, sort of below a few giga years, and it's the, they tend to show the, single, the signature the strongest. So anyway, this has been discussed by me and by in Chevin Laporte's papers and others, the MOST team papers from Wang and others. So there's a lot to know about the how you, you can actually probe this on location, phase space, age, and matter and so on. What was a revelation to us was this is my PhD student Shuri Akana working with Sanjeev and Torsten, was the cleanest way to see the phase spiral is an angular momentum in Z, one of the actions in Z around the center of the galaxy. When you do that, it seems to wash away all the substructure. And so, you, so it's got some important relationship. So stars, of course, all have a guiding radius. And around that radius, you have maybe a small amount or a large amount of regular motion. So if you start to put stars back to where their guiding radius is and then start slicing, basically what this is doing, then slicing in this domain, the phase spiral is much cleaner in location, much more constant in location uh, and in, uh, in radius or azimuth. So the angular momentum uh, encoding is particularly in LZ, J5, is particularly, uh, particularly interesting. So it, this, this whole phase spiral phenomenon has got some angular momentum property that we need to understand. So galactic seismology, the first thing we wanted to do is to do a new class of simulations where the disks had equilibrium and the bulge and so forth had equilibrium even before we hit it. Uh, and this has got us into the A gamma and Ramses combination. And what we did was re, uh, redo the Binion Schoenrich, which is an analytic model, uh, where they had a 2 times 10 to the 10 uh, mass, point mass coming for the disk, and then we were able to recover the phase spiral. And they make the point that to do this properly, you need a simulation for self consistency with 100 million particles. So that's what we did. We used a gamma to set up simulations with 100 million particles. So, just to show you how well this works in terms of the equilibrium, let me start with. Um, a uh, 4 billion year simulation of our Milky Way model. These are parameters taken from our annual reviews, but we've used distribution functions and we've set up the bulge and, and the disk and so forth uh, using the gamma code to have this long-term equilibrium. So this disk has long-term equilibrium. I'll show you some cuts in a moment in terms of line plots. And if you hit that with an impulse like that, for, uh, going through the outer disk beyond where the sun is, sort of we're at eight kiloparsecs, this went through at sort of uh, um, 20 kiloparsecs, and then you drive these rather beautiful waves and corrugations. And we would argue, and I think it's quite clear, that we see these uh, uh, phenomena with incredible clarity compared to uh, previous work, which I'll get to. So here are some cuts to show you how well that works. So this is the rotation curve in blue for the uh, total galaxy, total rotation curve. This is the dark halo, this is for the disk, and this is for bulge. 
the solid lines are at zero giga years and the dotted lines are at four giga years and they have a remarkable correspondence. So if we do that in terms of dispersion now, uh, Lau, of course, will know all about this for many years in this work field, but if you get below 100 million particles, 10 million particles or below that, you heat the disk, the stuff coming through. You really do need 100 million particles to suppress vertical heating. So you see that. Here's the vertical dispersion in Z at the beginning and end of the simulation, and the, uh, they look identical. But what is interesting, and surface density is identical as well in terms of the disk properties. This is for an isolated equilibrium disk. But what we do see, it has no real effect on our results because the effect is very small. Over 4 billion years, the radial dispersion does evolve very slightly. Um, we've spoken to Evgeny and with and the Ramses, you know, Roman Testia. We've had a discussion about this. I don't think any of us yet understand why you have this small or slow heating in, in radial dispersion, but it's there, but it's very weak and it has absolutely no impact on the results I'm going to show you. But anyway, it's a pretty impressive demonstration that you can form equilibrium models that survive um, in isolation for a very long time. So we've done these simulations to 2 billion years now. I've got here to 1 billion years because that's where most of the interesting behavior happens. But we do see what I'm about to show you survives for 1.5 billion years. We do see it peter out at the end of 1.5 billion years. So this is the first thing I wanted to show you. This kind of work has been done for a long time. I'm overlaying uh, a, a spiral uh, that has a particular property. Now, later on, it overlays the density wave, which is wrapping up with the differential rotation um, and epicyclic frequency behavior uh, rather cleanly. Later on, it overlays uh, this one spiral and there's the counter spiral rather well. If you go back to, the, if we then take that function and, and take it backwards in time to the beginning, it doesn't track. There's, a bit, there's basically uh, an M equals one mode early on it settles to a strong m equals two mode at a later time. So this actually ends up being quite important because that m equals one mode is preserved for the entire two billion year simulation. You actually see it in the data, which will give you a way of determining where in fact the impact happened as it came through the Milky Way disk. So this is basically every hundred million years in surface density, possumized 10 kiloparsecs, so 190. So uh, did I show you, did I miss a slide? I didn't. 190, 280, uh, 300 basically all the way up to a billion uh, years and steps of about 100 million years. So um, the formalism looks like this. It ha it's basically um, the angular uh, uh, frequency in the plane um, and the uh, radial frequency kappa. And this wraps up at about 30% of the wrapping up of the uh, differential shear. So, um, and, that the, and kappa is everywhere defined by the potential itself. We actually determine it from the simulation and that function is given by this formalism. It's really remarkable just how well this overlays. And we've also added uh, a term for, uh, for any pattern speed uh, that might exist, sort of a constant. Um, uh, basically, if the density wave is wrapping up purely through the epicyclic frequency, or is it, does it also have a, body, a, a, um, a solid body uh, component, which we do detect, but it's rather weak. But on top of that, we see something else, not just a density wave that wraps up. We also see a bending mode that wraps up. And that looks like this. If you start with a bending mode, write it very simple like this, and you allow the flat rotation differential shear to wrap it up, it wraps up as well. But this depends on the vertical frequency and not on the radial frequency. And that's always slower than the wrapping up the spiral arm. So the bending mode is wrapping up at sort of half the speed, half the rate on average to the density wave. So what you've got now is a bending mode that's wrapping up independently of the density wave. And these are essentially decoupled at least early on. So the spiral density wave is being pushed up and down like riding a surf, like riding a wave onto the surfboard uh, by the bending mode that rolls underneath it. So we call this the roller coaster model. And that dependence, this has come straight from Binney and Tremaine. Uh, M is the, the mode, which in this case is uh, M equals two. And basically what we're able to look at is, and this depends on the potential as well in the vertical direction. So that's the model that we're fitting to the data. So this is what it looks like if you step through it. The, um, this is the same as before. This is uh, density and projection, 90, uh, sorry, uh, I had to put my glasses on now, sorry. Uh, 67, 95, 143, 190 million years. Um, and this is now, I've, I've kept the same color code throughout. It, this is in um, um, vertical motion is purple, uh, is, is, is moving towards us. 
uh, orange or brown is moving away from us. And this is displacement. Green is, is displaced towards us. Pink is displaced away from us. And what you see is how this evolves with time. There's actually a movie that on a website address that I gave before. It's actually in the paper. You can look at this as a movie. And this thing wraps up uh, as you're seeing here, but the wrapping up of the, of the density wave in the bending mode are quite, quite distinct. And you can keep this going now, 285, 380, 476, 571. And we trace this all the way through on the website to 2 billion years. And you can see now that, the, that what began as a sort of n equals one evolves into an n equals two. And, and then you get this bending mode, which is seen in the terms of displacement and velocity um, and the density wave uh, seen here is quite independent of what you see here. So to make that clear, and this is going forward in time um, to up to a billion years in this case. Or the circles, I might say, are the volumes I extract to show you the phase spiral that comes out of it. I'll show that in a moment. And the solar neighborhood is the circle one, but that comes a little bit later. So just to show you that these really are different, I've overlaid the simple, um, the uh, omega minus Capricorn two wrapping up of this density wave on top of the bending mode, which is the omega minus uh, nu upon two given by the ver vertical frequency. And I've superimposed these. So early on, there's a strong m equals one, it degenerates into an m equals two within this radius. And you can now see that the bending mode, if you look carefully, is evolving forwards in a way which is quite distinct from the speed with which the density wave wraps up. So the density wave is literally riding up and down, up and down on, the, uh, on this bending mode under, underneath it. And that hasn't been seen before in simulations. I don't think you could see this because of the resolution and the equilibrium state that we have here, the equilibrium conditions. Now, interestingly, people have made this point in different ways. Some people have felt that the corrugations we're observing may be some kind of ripple effect. I don't know how that could possibly happen, but people have drawn that in our neighborhood. Others have said, well, maybe these corrugations are somehow to do with the, the uh, spiral arms. And maybe these are all, these are closely linked to the, the, the distribution of the spiral arms. So, so people have made rather beautiful sketches of, of these corrugations, because I say these wave-like behavior has been known about in density space, kinetic space for a number of years and they've drawn these rather uh, sort of ingenious cartoons. I don't think any of these are remotely relevant to what happens in nature. I think that's not right, and that's not right either, um, as I was just describing before. So, but something like this is, is, I think, existing. There are these bending modes, there are these spiral ways, but they don't, they don't work together in quite this way. So let me show you this graphically. Um, ignore the outer patches that correlate with these circles for a moment. Um, just look at the spiral arm. So the density wave uh, is seen here for each of these. This is one arm, this is the other arm, and it's displaced. This is green means towards you, pink means away from you. If you track each of these spiral arms, they're being pushed away from you, they're being pushed towards you. Same with the other one, being pushed away from you, towards you. So you can physically see that as these density waves wrap up, they're, they're literally riding up and down on the bending mode, uh, like a roller coaster. So, what was interesting was to find that the phase spiral in each of these volumes showed no correlation with the, either the, uh, the density waves or the bending mode, or even important caustics and crossings of these, of these. We looked and there's nothing at all obvious. The phase spiral emergence is slow. It takes about 400 million years, but it does build. It's an ancient signature. And when it does build, it hangs around for at least a billion years. So you can see that we're getting, so for example, in these circles down here, you're seeing the, the, uh, in the VR and V phi encoding. So, um, the, the, so it's the sort of, a, to borrow from Feynman, it's like a summation of over histories that you really do need to look, because of the, the, the strong time dependence in each VZ, Z space, it's very hard to say, uh, you just don't see, but there is something about, I'm about to show you, there is something, but not this. If you go into these obvious projected properties of bending modes and density waves, you don't see any kind of correlation of these phase spirals with this behavior. Um, and so what we're trying to match over here. Uh, so the phase spiral builds over a long time. And when it stay, it, and it, it has to spread where, where the impact site, it has to spread around the disk and then it has to evolve. So this is what we've looked at next. So these circles, one through 12, are the columns in the next uh, slide. So this is the VR encoding so this is the V phi encoding, this is the VR encoding. So early on, T equals zero, 
The solar neighborhood actually is column seven. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's t equals zero and I'm going every 50 million years. And we show this on the website for the whole two billion years so then you see the phase spiral fade away eventually. Um, early on, there's nothing going on because there's no impact yet. The impact happened at 95 million years and you start to get these low order modes. And in time, you start to see um, uh, a buildup of this phase spiral. It appears in a few odd places early on. In time, it spreads and eventually you see it everywhere in Asimov. So these boxes and rectangles are used in the paper to explain key behaviors. What I wanted to show you was something really, which I, we found quite interesting. If you look at that and blow your eyes, you can see vertical banding. You can see it particularly prominently here. If you look like this, like seam, coal seams, this is coming from Australia and where we are polluting the world with our enormous coal resources. So if you see a seam, a stratum going this way, and then it's, there's blue band through here, red band through here, and so on. There's, if you see it all the way through the simulation, if you look carefully, there are these vertical bands. And the question is, what are those vertical bands? And this ends up being very important for how the phase spiral is kicking in and how it's being essentially accelerated over the course of time. And it's this. Let me just go back to this figure in a moment. If you look at where the, in, in our case, the impact site happened at 20 kiloparsecs, we happened at 8 kiloparsecs. And basically, because it's flat rotation, we go around the sun in, say, 240, 30, 20 million years. The impact site goes around the sun um, over a longer time frame. So the question is, when do we essentially catch up with the impact site? And that takes about 400 million years. So if I go back to this figure, these black boxes are when, we, when the solar neighborhood catches up with the impact site in terms of the radius vector. Um, and you definitely see the effect of the, the, essentially the outer disk is doing this for all time, which is probably why it's stronger out there than I realized. The Lamas team are showing that the phase spiral can be seen to 12 or more kiloparsecs, which I thought was amazing. Um, and uh, maybe we're going to see it far more clearly with Gaia DR3. Uh, and it's because, I think, because the impact site happened farther out. And when we catch up, this really helps to enable uh, the excitation and to keep it going. And so there's a banding effect caused by when we overtake, when we come through and over, uh, undertake, as it were, the, the position of the radius vector of the impact site. So let me get to my conclusions, because I'm running out of time. Here's the conclusions. We reproduce Antoja's phase spiral result. Um, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, I could certainly nitpick um, uh, uh, both uh, the, how the data have been presented and how our observations have been presented. And I think it's pretty jolly good. It's, this is the first time that we've matched it in terms of the amplitude. Uh, the port, we previously worked by Laporte and, my, and myself in that 2019, the Z and VZ distribution, the range was twice as large. So we're getting down to the right range in terms of Z and VZ now. We're, we're plus or minus 60 kiloparsecs plus or minus, uh, sorry, plus or minus 60 kilometers per second plus or minus one kiloparsec. So that the amplitude now is right. So, and, the, and, the, and the, the number of stars participating, so 10% phenomenon is also uh, about right that you pick up in the, in the projected space. So that's good. Um, but this is, this is crucial. Because the phase spiral is so long lived and takes so long to build, I think there's no chance that this is caused by the last crossing for two reasons. One is the time it takes to build this. The second, because the mass of Sag is way too small. I think most papers now agree it's less than 10 to the 9 in total. I think Vasiliev's last paper and Belokarov and others are saying, and I think even the original papers with Majewski and, um, and his colleague, I'm sorry, I forgot the first author, beautiful paper in 2005, uh, they were saying that the mass is whatever it is. And I think the evidence for that, which has not been made stated clearly, which is in our new version of our paper, which I'm happy to send to anyone that wants it, which should be an astral PH in fact, a day or two, uh, is this. If you look at the LMC's abundance distribution, alpha upon iron, iron upon hydrogen, this is comparing LMC, this is the Apogee survey from Nidavirdal. If you compare Apogee to the galaxy, this is the distribution offset that you see, this is well known for a number of dwarfs, but look at SAG. SAG is pretty much the same metallicity range, in fact some of their plots show the metallicity range has been even higher. So I would argue that SAG must have been an LMC mass system when it fell in, I don't think there's any evidence against this whatsoever, but it's been losing a lot of mass on infall like these things do. And it would have to have lost between maybe uh, one dex to 0.5 of the X in each orbit loop. I mean, it's like two crossings. 
So it has to go you know, around like this twice to the disk. So I think it's losing a lot of mass in the last few uh, transits. And it once had a mass of the LMC, otherwise how do you explain the metallicity distribution? So I think it's a previous crossing. It could be 1 billion years ago, it could be 2 billion years ago. I think the crossings are actually like one, three and five giga years, that kind of thing. And the last one was like a hundred million years ago, a few hundred million years ago. So I think what we're seeing is an ancient relic of a past impact event. And it does require this infalling object to be losing mass at quite a rate. And I don't think, I think simulations would tend to support this kind of mass loss in any event when you're this far into the, into the galaxy. Thank you very much. People, if anyone has questions, so please raise your hands and I will call on you um, just to kind of get started. You mentioned that this is the first simulations that uh, reproduce the uh, amplitude um, of the signal correctly. And is there a single thing or, or, or like um, that you think is uh, the, like that fixed that, the issues that say Sharin simulations had? Yeah, um, um, that's actually a very helpful question. Um, can I just flick through quickly to a slide I left out? Um, yeah. Oops, sorry. Let me show you something. This is a point, uh, what am I doing? Yeah, let me, here, uh, I left, I had this slide in here. Where is it? Hold this, there we are. This is from my 2019 paper. Um, the ZVZ amplitude depends very much on where you are in the galaxy. So I, I thought I had, an, oh, there we go. So if you're, this is R of 20 kiloparsecs, 17, 14, 11, eight, and five kiloparsecs. So if you're in the inner disk, the phase spiral elongates in VZ and compresses in Z because the surface density is higher. And, and, and of course, omega Z is higher. So things are now moving much faster in that direction. So the phase spiral does something a little bit different. So basically the phase spiral that you see depends critically on where you are in the galaxy. So if you don't get the local disk properties right, you don't get this amplitude right. Um, and it's all to do with action. These are, these are stepping in, in JZ action. So root, square root of JZ is what defines the energy in this. It's quite a, lo a lot of discussion, sort of Binney Tremaine type discussion you have to get through to see how this all hangs together. But what I'm saying is the phase spiral, we're getting the phase spiral right locally because we've got the physics of the disk right locally. But if you went in a galaxy or you went out a galaxy, the phase spiral, the elongation goes in the other direction. Uh, and this has already been seen, by the way. The, the I think. Um, I think we even see it a little bit in ours. When we go a little bit inwards, you see it go upwards like this. And uh, the Moss team and maybe Shervin's paper uh, shows the phase spiral elongate in the other direction. So this is actually an observation now. I just haven't had time to show that. Oh, that's, that's very helpful. Uh, that's like my 2019 Charles. paper. Uh, great. Uh, Charles, go ahead. Oh, hi, hi, Joss. Uh, hi, Charles. For, forgive me, I came to the colloquium late. Um, oh. for reasons we won't go into. So it's possible you, you address this clearly in the first half of your- Can I ask your... you where roughly, halfway through or uh, last few slides? Oh, pretty much halfway through actually, about on, on, okay. on half hour more or less. Um, so I just wanted to understand the, the nature of the, of the spiral waves. Hmm. They, they appear to be all waves that if left to their own devices, it kind of dissipate by wrapping up or, or whatever process you describe. So I'm just, and, and I may misunderstand you here, but would there be spiral structure in disk galaxies if there were not infall of large objects like Sagittarius? Well, you know you're asking an incredibly loaded question. And if I had Alain Toumri online, thank God we don't. Uh, well, this would Alan's end up an being... old friend, so. Oh yeah, he's an old friend, uh, but he's... An... <laughs> if you go to a conference and raise that issue, uh, the whole conference degenerates into uh, the fact that we're all doing it wrong. Uh, Okay, so uh, how do I distill? Um, so Binny and Tremaine, let me just start by saying, if you read my 2020 paper, uh, I, I would say I'm the first one to revisit this in a sort of rather comprehensive way, because I read the Binny and Tremaine final chapters, which got me through Agris Kalnesh's work and Tumwe's work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of literature that just on um, bending modes and density waves, and whether they're coupled, whether they're not coupled, WKB approximations, and they say, we don't know what's going on. We have no idea. We're gonna do simulations to figure this stuff out. So the spiral density wave that you're seeing wrapping up, that is not differential shear alone. That would wrap up three times faster. It's actually the Lindblad, sort of a lindblad kalmash resonance. It's omega minus kappa upon two, where kappa is given by the local potential. 
d squared phi by d r squared. Mm -hmm. So that wraps up three times slower than what differential shear would do for you. And that's expected. If you go through the literature, this has been known for a long time that if you excite with an impact, an impulse, uh, uh, wrapping up spiral alarm, that it would not wrap up with differential shear, it would wrap up with this elliptic orbit approximation. So a lot of people have said this, but they've never seen it. As, I mean, they've tried to fit these sorts of models and never seen it anywhere near as clearly as we see it. We see an exact, we see that exactly. And there's even a small pattern speed on top of it. So it's, it really is a density wave. The whole thing is wrapping up as, as in omega minus omega uh, Capricorn two um, uh, with a solid body component as well, slow, but it's there. So it's, it's some kind of density wave and some kind of internal resonance. The bending mode is the same thing, but now that depends on the vertical frequency, which is slower. So it's wrapping up at a different rate. Um, so there's, and, and, and it has its own resonances, you know, which are like Lindbergh resonances, which are quite separate from the, the, the radial resonances. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. They, they literally are in the regime I'm showing you completely decoupled. They're doing their own thing. Yeah. Uh, and the literature has asked the question, um, surely the, if these things start doing their thing and wrapping up, they should surely at some point depend on each other with a lot of wrap up. Um, and I haven't looked at that. I haven't gone to 1.5 to 2 billion, 3 billion years to see what happens in the, in the strong nonlinear regime. You didn't, you came close to answering my question, but not quite. Right. So just imagine a disk galaxy that is never hit by an, a, a, a neighbor. Would it, would it exhibit uh, visible density waves? All right, okay. So there are other sources of this. Um, Elena and Lars have a beautiful paper which show how the excitation, you get little swing amplification around, they say you've got 8,000 molecular clouds running around. Mm. You get little swing amplifications due to these clouds and they also uh, can generate um, sort of flocculent spiral. Mm. Stellar bars, if they form drive grand design spiral arms, uh, and uh, massive mergers also drive grand design spiral arms. So, so you've got stochastic noise can drive it, um, quadrupole, um, strong quadrupole terms can drive it. But the question is, does it, if you let it go, does it survive? Mm -hmm. I think that's your question. Yeah. If you don't have an inner bar, if you don't have molecular clouds, if you don't have a perturber, can these things excite and go long-term by themselves? Well, in fact, Widrow checkers looked at that, I don't think it, they'd see it, they, they sort of see it, they sort of see that, you know, the clumpy dark matter halo can also, any substructure can drive, can drive some kind of excitation. Uh, it looks pretty, very low amplitude, very flocculent, I'm not even sure it's what you would call spiral arms. Okay. So here's the question, the arms we see in our galaxy, if you believe what I'm saying, some of those arms are not driven by the bar. Some of the, or stochastic, or well, they could be stochastic noise. Some of these arms are driven by the perturber. They have to be driven by the perturber. Yeah, okay. Thank you. It's a very, it's a, that question is, an in, is so big to, to, you need a whole conference on it, really. <laughs> Gus, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, Josh, for the excellent talk. I, uh, so I've Hi, actually been, okay. I've been working uh, over the past year on doing uh, galaxy isolated disk initial conditions. So I'm very sensitive mm. to uh, this, uh, the difficulty of sort of getting the thing set up in, in sort of perfect equilibrium. Um, nice. But uh, so I'm very appreciative of that aspect and it, like the simulations look really, uh, really nice. But um, one thing I wanted to ask was uh, that Sagittarius didn't impact a disk that was perfectly in equilibrium. And then it, it definitely had mm. like sort of different components to it. So like spiral arms uh, at the bar yeah. uh, and so on. And so do you expect, and you know, previous impacts of Sagittarius itself even. So do you expect that like, um, that'll affect sort of the formation and the evolution of the phase spirals? And are there like sort of observational things that we can look for that might uh, indicate this, like any of these like sort of higher order interactions? Gus, you're asking such a good question. And we've got simulations galore running to get to the bottom of things. I mean, for example, this is, galactic seismology has enormous richness into the future, especially with Gaia. Um, the bar, the bar is, as we, as we, as I mentioned in the 2020 paper, the bar and the annual reviews, the bar is incredibly aligned. There's also an extended cold bar. Um, how does that survive an impact if the impact is close in? So our simulations now are looking at the uh, impact radii to see how that bar survives. You have to form it and evolve it. So that bar is an enormously important tracer of something because it's, it's not just the fact the bar is it's aligned within five 
uh, when it's a physical angle with the inner disc, which is astonishing. I asked Ortwin to measure this for, for, with Christian Berg for, for the annual reviews, which we wrote into the annual reviews. And the, but more than that, there's a long bar, which is very, very cold, which nobody has yet been able to, to demonstrate. Lila Thanasula has been doing this for 40 years. She can't create it either. Uh, and others that form bars from initial conditions and simulations. So that, that, that very cold bar goes way out. How the heck has that survived? It wasn't created by the last impact, the last few impacts. It may have been created by a much earlier impact. So inner bar dynamics and the merger dynamics together is an incredibly important tracer. So whether it had came before or after is something we're looking at. You know, do we excite it and then see the con? So I, what I can tell you, if you look at um, uh, Kokoskov's paper, is if you make that bar buckle, then you can drive all sorts of wave-like properties. I don't think that work is right because the bar that we see today is so aligned. I think it's the opposite. You have to make the bar not buckle. Um, so, so you and then then there's the issue of molecular clouds and and spiral arms that are stochastically excited. So we're trying to get on top of all of that. And not to mention that we haven't got a, we've got a smooth dark matter halo right now. We don't have a clumpy dark matter halo. Uh, so there's a lot of extra stuff to put in that might wash the stuff away. The signatures might be much weaker. So thank you for that question. But yes, realism is what we're after now. Well, Joss, do you have some a uh, few more minutes to stick around? There are a couple of. Uh more raised hands. Joss? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, ask, ask away, sorry. OK, uh, I was asking if you have, you, if you can take a couple of more questions. Oh, yeah, as many as you like. Uh, I have to be in a university about an hour and a half, plenty of time. OK, great. Uh, then, Razik, uh, uh, go ahead. Hi, very fascinating talk. That was very fantastic. So I have a question regarding to the alpha FE that you mentioned. I totally understand that if you want to consider like the highest actually level quality of the data and then compare them up with the cosmological simulation, in detail, we may not be able to explain them just like 100%. So I was wondering, it's just like a question of actually fact about what would be the most useful exercise to do if we want to consider like cosmological hydro simulation, like for example, TNG actually, and look at uh, some of these samples of Milky Way galaxies and just like check that out, you know, how close they yeah. are to the data. So in our actually very just like quick exercise, we found that there are some levels of bimodality even at the level of yeah. the disk actually, but I don't actually know what would be the most useful question to ask, you know, taking into account that there are some idealization and, you know, some crucial physics that definitely in all of these cosmological hydro are off actually, you know. So let me, that's a nice, very nice question. Let me just give you my, I thought a lot about the simulations and what they give. I've actually worked with Andrew Wetzel quite a lot on this, these sorts of issues that what they should, I feel they should be doing. I think the alpha rich, alpha poor components are extremely important to get right, and we're a long way from getting them right. I don't think anyone even gets close, Eagle or anybody else. So the um, look at M31. M31, as far as I can tell, and M Milky Way are quite different in terms of their disks. M31 has this old alpha rich disk, and then uh, uh, and the mass carrying component of ours is the uh, is the alpha poor disk. So simulations that show, I can imagine, I could imagine, I remember the gamma survey showing that a lot of disks are, uh, because the bulge separation wasn't done very well, a lot of disks are red and old, not young. And I don't just mean S zeros, I mean spirals. So, um, so I think people should look at red disks, old disks with alpha rich components. And you could easily imagine having only that, only the alpha, uh, a more massive, uh, thick alpha rich disk, so it comes the wrong word now, puffed up uh, in the inner parts. Uh, or, uh, and the alpha pore is, is sometimes there and sometimes not there. So M31 is, the, is, crudely speaking, is the reverse of us. It has a pretty pathetic alpha pore disk and a mass carrying alpha rich disk, whereas we're the opposite. We have a mass carrying alpha pore disk and a, and a pretty wimpy alpha. So, and, and then the radial extent tells you something about the early phases of disk formation. So I think looking at that by modality in alpha rich, alpha pore and its action space which no one gets right. We've looked at four lots of simulations that don't even get close to getting the stuff right. So uh, can you compare to my 2019 action space versus metallicity. So I strongly recommend that you look at creating alpha rich, alpha poor disks and cosmological simulations. And don't expect to always see both. You might get one or the other or sometimes, and, and there's an admixture of these that come and go. That would be an enormously useful thing to do because you have to track a disk evolution from, from early times. 
exactly. So, right. So, something that we want to actually, we wish to do would be just like to track the alpha and FE back in time and really figure out if it's like a clean time that this by modality actually would just yeah. get started, you know. And the other things that is just very related would be do you think that actually if we, if we just like divide those disk stars, actually those stars to disk stars and also hello like stars, do you think there could be any correlation between the bimodality that is observed in the disk versus those that are observed in actually in the hello? Or like, or they could be just like completely separate, you know, phenomena. I, I, I could not answer that question quickly. That's a whole story. The whole galactic archaeology is about, you know, unraveling the alpha to ion, ion to hydrogen distribution diagram, phase diagram, if you will, for all the components. And it's a very complicated story. So uh, I can't give you a quick answer. The basically most things that are old look to be alpha to ion enhanced, and the and what so it just didn't take me too long to go through the step by step. The the alpha the alpha the uh, the dwarf galaxies seem to have very different distributions. Uh, stochastic distributions almost, and they have trends, but they're offset with respect to each other. But, uh, but I think the bulge, the halo, and the bar have have uh, properties that are telling us something that you're definitely seeing some sort of differentiation, but also not just in time, but in radius. You know, because what happens is a function of radius and in time. So inner bar, outer bar, inner halo, outer halo, inner bulge, outer bulge. That's a very complicated story. I don't think I can't see a quick way of answering your question. Okay, thank you so much. That was All really right. helpful. Thank you. And sort of uh, like the final question goes to Rohan, who actually has some of these plots in his uh, paper from last year. So anyway, interested parties should go Sorry. check it out. Who, who, that oh, Rohan, Rohan Naidu. Yeah. Hello, Rohan. Hey, uh, Josh, this is beautiful. I loved all the grid plots <laughs> in the core. Um, so I wanted to uh, ask questions about this, this last point that you made about Sagittarius's metallicity. Um, mm. Because what you're showing here is the metallicity of the remnant, right? But we think a lot of the mass is actually in the streams and we measure yeah. the metallicity um, in the streams to be like minus one-ish, right? And so if you take like a weighted average, you ended up with something like uh, something closer to minus one, like minus 0.85 or minus 0.9. And that according to like most mass metallicity relations would imply um, a mass that is not as massive as the LMC, right? Like many times fewer. So I was curious, like, what do you think? So, yeah, okay. But I don't think of the streams as separate from the core of the galaxy. To me, what I want to say is what this thing has been disrupted. Let's add up the complete inventory of all the stars, inner and outer. And there definitely is a strong gradient, as you say. And it's the inner part that to me, you know, where the most of the stars and most of the light is that, that, that you are comparing to these photometric relations by people like, um, I can't remember now who did this, this uh, the, uh, has it Mary Mateo's review, or, um, Elaine Tolstoy's review, but there's plots of what metallicity looks like as a function of the photometric metallicity versus photometric mass and so on. So to me, you, do, you sort of have to add up all the stars and ask, how do you explain all the stars as a unit and then relate that to projections of, of, of Dwarf, dwarf galaxies. So I don't want to separate the tails from the body at all. I just want to put it all back together again and say, what could have produced that? And then I had to go looking for a plot. And there are lots of vague plots with few points. But this new work was saved by Nidhava's new work. And there's also another one. I've just forgotten the name of the author. Same year, Hayes, I think. Another Hayes Majeski. Take those two papers together. They're very beautiful. And they show uh, that, they, that the distribution to me, I mean, you have, look at that. I mean, just look for your... So itself, and you tell me whether the Sag, and it's true that if you take more of the tail, you do extend it down, that's true. But that, that, is, that is a, a representative plot, I think, of the inner five kiloparsecs in radius of, of Sag. And I look at that and I would say, you would not be able to distinguish those in terms of mass in a sort of, some sort of simple generic sense of, of closed models. Um, and I, th I, I, think, I think you just have to, I would say that just because we have this pathetic remnant now, it would have to surely have been stripped enormously. And it's, it seems to have gone, you know, people are giving it up to 12 orbits or something. And you know that you're stripping mass much faster more recently. So I would be surprised if it wasn't losing mass at a great rate. Fair enough. Thanks. 
Thanks, Joss. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's been a really nice well, seeing so many of you here and uh, hearing this lovely discussion. So I guess until uh, next week, see, see you then. It's great. And I can't wait to come and see you all. I've, I've enjoyed every trip. Um, uh, seeing Charles, it's been a long time, Charles. So it's great to see you. And Ramesh, and um, it's been a while, Lars, of course. Yeah. Lars comes to Australia, so you're all welcome. I'd invite you all to come. You know, Lars makes my life easy, but the rest of you, I'm always jet lagged when I catch up with you. We should meet in New Zealand. Oh, yeah, of course, your hometown. Um, isn't, that, isn't that where you're from, homeland, in New Zealand? Yes, I grew up in New Zealand. Yeah, well, you're the, probably the best country in the world in terms of handling the virus. <laughs> yes. So. They even tell us off for having one case. They say, Australia, get your act together. You've got one case, you know. They're uh, rather proud of their performance. Yes, well, deservedly so. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, well done. Well done to your people. <laughs> All right, thank you.